I mean, even Kay in, 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 in this Bible study book took four chapters to touch the depths, and we can't even touch the depths of the amazing, uh, majestic awesomeness of what's in Colossians chapter 1. So just in, in our, my introduction, um, this letter was written by Paul the Apostle, and Paul was of the tribe of Benjamin, and his father was a Pharisee. Paul himself was mentored under the guidance and instruction of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was a prominent rabbi who really knew the Jewish law. I mean, he was the rabbi of all rabbis. And so Paul studied under him, and he became a Pharisee before his conversion. That's what he was. He was the Pharisees of all Pharisees. He had a zeal for the Jewish law and um, praise God that Paul got converted because we are sitting here tonight reading his letter to the church at Colossus. But this letter was written to the church um, at Colossus and this, um, this city is close to Laodicea which is one that we are kind of familiar with for the book of Revelation. Um, and it was born no doubt from the account in the book of Acts, if we look there, we don't have to go there now, but if you look there in chapters 19 and 20 of the book of Acts, we see the dynamic ministry that Paul had there. And it was dynamic. It was in Acts 20 where he says, but none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the grace of the gospel, or the gospel of the grace of God. It was in that same chapter that Paul declared, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole gospel of God, or the whole counsel of God. Paul was in prison when he penned this letter, um, and he was chained to a Roman guard while he was writing this. The other three epistles that he wrote at the same time was they were Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. And they were all wrote at the same time. He also wrote Philippians, but that was a little bit later. Looking at the city of Coloss, it's really important tonight that I just do this little bit of introduction because it's, 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 it's the background of why he wrote this letter to the church. And he wrote it to us as we sit here tonight. But the city, um, this area at one time had been a main trade route um, from east to west where practically all commerce going through that um, Asia Minor passed and made through the cities there. And it was, there was a three, one of the three cities and they were extremely wealthy because of this. But um, until Rome came into power and began building roads everywhere, the new Roman road through this region, instead of going through Colossus, it bypassed this city and it gradually became less and less prominent and eventually became very obscure. obscure. It was a small, like, backwater town. And it was in this condition of the, the city at this time is when Paul wrote this epistle. And that struck me as I wrote this. I thought, God cares about the backwater towns. Those, those of us that are little people, you know, he cares about us so much. Um, but Paul wrote this letter at this time. That's what the city, the state of the city was. The spiritual life there was a mix of heretical heresies everywhere. Um, Gnosticism was big at the time. And I was thinking about Pastor Phil's message yesterday and about the Muslim faith and everything. And it was, it's very similar to what the people in Colossus were facing. Um, Eastern philosophies, Jewish legalism, Gnosticism, which is the worship of the intellect. Gnostics believed that they had superior knowledge concerning spiritual things and that Jesus was a created being and that because of that, he was not divine, nor, would he, nor was he deity, because anything that was physical or had matter to it was evil. That's what they, they believed. Now, the real problem with the teaching that this physical matter is evil is from a doctrinal standpoint for you and I, you can't apply it to Jesus that way. The Gnostics reasoned that if matter was evil, then Jesus couldn't have come in the flesh, because then he would have been evil, and so many Gnostics claim that he must have come as a spirit, not as physical flesh and blood. And ladies, this is doctrinal. This is like so important for you and I to know this because we have Mormons, uh, uh, Jehovah Witnesses. There's so many different people around us that do not 
believe that Jesus came in the flesh. So this is so important. We're facing this. And so as women of God, in 2016, we need to know that He came in the flesh. He was God. He is God. And He was the fullness of God. And so we need to know that. Um, and we read that and study that in chapter 1, which I love. But that's why um, the Apostle John even opened his first epistle. In 1 John, he wrote this. He said, in 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, he wrote this. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and then I underlined this, and our hands handled. Jesus, physical, concerning the word of life, uppercase W, uppercase L, word of life, Jesus. So he said this because he was also trying to refute this Gnostic teaching that Jesus did not come in a physical body. Other Gnostics believe that since Jesus was a physical man and that since the physical was evil, like I said, and God cannot be evil, Jesus could not have been God in the flesh. That's another thing that they were facing, and we face that. There are people all over that we meet. I have people at work and people we talk to. They don't believe that Jesus was God. And that's an important doctrinal, because your salvation is based on this, ladies. And so... And that's why Paul said in Colossians 2, 8 and 9, Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the to tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That is Colossians 2, 8 9. We're going to get there next time. <laughs> but So in this short epistle, Paul talks of the beauty, the divinity, the magnificence of our Jesus. And Paul wanted to warn and tell the church at Colossus, and we can heed the warning and hear what he's saying, um, that the test of any religious teaching is the place that Jesus holds within it. The test of any religious teaching is the place that Jesus holds within it. It's so important. And he spoke of the deity of Christ, the supremacy and the divinity of Christ, and that he was both man and God. Because any teaching that denies or minimizes these things are false teachings and occultic, period. So that was the city. That was the flavor of what was going on. The church at Colossus. Well, the one thing we know about the church in Colossus was that Paul didn't plan it. In fact, Paul never seen it or visited there, which is why it's not mentioned in the book of Acts. You won't see it there because he wasn't there. He wasn't physically there. But we do read in chapter 1 of Colossians, verse 4 and in verse 9 that um, of this epistle, that Paul had heard about their faith but had never actually seen him face to face. So how did it get started? Where did this church start? How did it start? Well, it was no doubt out of an outgrowth of Paul's three-year ministry in Ephesus. We read in Acts 19.10 that the witness of the church at Ephesus that he was in was so powerful that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Gentiles. So his ministry just the word just flourished under his ministry. So during Paul's ministry in Ephesus, there were two men from Coloss who were brought to faith in Jesus Christ, Epaphras and Philemon. And we will read in Colossians 1, 7 that Epaphras went back to Coloss, shared the gospels with his friends and family, and the result was that many were brought to faith in Christ and a church was born. And I thought about that. And I thought about you and me. And I think about the simplicity, the, the, the simplicity that we have to just share the gospel with those closest to us, our family, our friends, our coworkers, those people that we have bonded with. What God can do with that. And yet so many times I know I don't. <laughs> I know we tend to, we just don't. Or we have and we've given up. And we say, ah, oh, they're not listening. I'm not going to talk anymore. You know, um, but all oh, the power in that. And I think about that's how our church started. That's how Calvary Chapel Elk Grove started. When Pastor Phil got saved, the first thing he did was witness to me. And then he witnessed to his aunt. 
who got saved before me, and then I got saved, and then he witnessed to his friends, and then he witnessed to his cousins who brought friends, and all of a sudden this Bible study started in the kitchen of his aunt's house in Elk Grove Village. That's how the church started. And then studies was in our home, church was in our home for over a year and a half. We, that's where church services were. And it was all as a result of him just sharing with the people he loved the most, the gospel that saved him. And so that's what happened here. And um, we see that Epaphras, the pastor there, also had a ministry in the cities of Heropolis and Laodicea. We see that in Colossians 4. So God didn't need apostles really to start churches back then. He sometimes used normal, everyday Christians like you and me to start a work. And he will do that through you and me. The Colossian assembly was predominantly Gentile in membership. How do I know that? Why do I say that? Because we read in Colossians 3, um, Paul names sins that were commonly associated with Gentiles. So we're, I'm, we're, we just, because of that, we see that's probably what he's addressing here. The church was probably about five years old when Paul wrote this letter. And so let's, if you're there, I don't know if you're there, but open your Bible. Because we're just going to take this verse by verse tonight. At some spots, we're going to spend a little more time than others. There's no way we can touch the hem of the garment of the glory that is written in chapter 1 tonight. I prayed today as I was before God that I and you both would spend our time face down before him over verses in chapter 1 because they are glorious and I can't even do it justice but only God can. Um, there's such rich treasures in this one chapter. So Colossians 1 verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. Well, here we see, let's just stop right there. Paul begins this letter with a typical Paul introduction. I love that. He always begins telling that his call is by the will of God. No doubt to tell the people that God has called me to speak to you. I'm speaking on behalf of God. Take it as that, that God is speaking through me. Verse 2, he says, To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I love, there's two things I see here. I see the saints and that they are faithful. Sainthood is something that we have a wrong concept of. Saint means to be set apart. Saint means to be set apart in Christ. We will notice here that there are two very, very important words that qualify anyone who is a believer, that they are set apart and they are faithful <coughs> in the Lord. And so, but in Christ, in Christ is the key here, in Christ. Those are the two words that qualify all believers to be saints and faithful. And we can personalize this verse too. We can personalize it to say, to those of you who are set apart and faithful in Christ at Calvary Chapel Elk Grove, for those of you who are set apart and faithful in Christ, my question, I always write questions and I always give them to you. <laughs> You can take them now, you can take them later, you don't have to answer them at all. But I always write questions when I'm reading scripture to myself. I'll say, am I set apart unto God like I should be? Am I being sanctified daily? We will never attain women. We won't. But oh, how, I don't know, I want so badly to be so much more today than I was yesterday and so much more tomorrow than I am today for Jesus. Oh, he's so worthy of that um, in me. Um, so are you set apart unto him? Are you faithful in applying his standards in your life? Faithful to the word of God. Are you in Christ? It's so good to check to see if you're truly born again and saved. Are you in Christ? Paul says his wonderful here, grace and peace to you. And you know, any of you have who've heard me before on grace and peace, I describe grace and peace as two best friends, hand in hand, skipping together. They, they just belong together. You cannot have the peace without the grace of God. 
And you will see in every one of Paul's epistles, he, his introduction is like that, grace and peace to you. And um, notice that grace always comes before peace because you cannot have the peace of God without first experiencing the grace of God. K. Smith said, and I quote, grace and peace is not a casual greeting. Grace expresses God's favor even though we are completely undeserving of it. The word peace comes from the Hebrew word shalom, which means more than an absence of trouble, but it also is the personal well-being that comes from the indwelling presence of God. This greeting is meant to produce a glorious awareness of God's work in you. Doesn't God's unmerited favor in your life make you awestruck? It just, it takes me back that his favor toward me, I'm so undeserving of it, and yet he finds favor toward me. The indwelling presence of God in you and in me, the indwelling presence of God. You know, we know it, but if we just stop and just think it, wow, the indwelling presence of God is in you and in me. And sometimes it takes my breath away to think about that. It humbles me and it makes me want to reflect him more accurately that because he's dwelling in me, you know? Not that I do fall short, but that's my heart. I so want to, I so want to. And don't you want to because of his indwelling presence within you? So verse three says, we give thanks. We, he's speaking of him and Timothy. Timothy was his friend and co-laborer in Christ and was with him. We give thanks to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. I love that Paul gives thanks for the believers in Coloss. He's thankful. He gives thanks for them. And he prays always for them. And I think about, we need to be mindful, not only to be thankful for one another. You know, sometimes we get so busy in our lives and we take for granted the people the blessings that we don't take that time to be thankful for those in our lives and so we need to be mindful to be thankful for those in our lives and to pray for those we love to be fervent to be enduring to be praying at all times we like Paul need to pray always it says always for those requests that have we've been praying for for years that remain unanswered we need to pray, we need to pray more, and we need to keep on praying. God hears, God listens, and in his most perfect timing and in his most perfect way, he will answer. But we must pray always. I love that about Paul. He will see that a few times in this epistle. Always praying, praying without ceasing. Um, we must pray Paul penned Ephesians 6, 18. Let me read this verse in the Amplified. He said, pray at all times on every occasion and in every season in the spirit with all manner of prayer and entreaty. To that end, keep alert and watch with strong purpose and perseverance interceding in behalf of all the saints, God's consecrated people. I know we get weary in our prayer lives. It is hard. The enemy comes against us in our prayer lives. He wants to keep us from being on our face before God. He wants to keep us from searching our hearts before God. He wants to keep us from interceding. Why? There is power in the prayer of the saints. There is power. God hears the magnificent, supreme, all-knowing, all creator God hears your and my prayers. Satan knows that. He will keep us. He will discourage us. He will tell us to stop praying. He will tell us the prayers aren't making a difference. He will tell you you're not praying in the right manner. Do you know what? When you're praying in the spirit, you're praying in the right manner. 
And as women of God, we need to go fall before God and say, Lord, I want to pray in the Spirit. Because when I pray in the Spirit, I know I am praying what you want me to pray. Lord, I don't know what this is, but I want it. And he will give it to you. Be encouraged. Do not stop praying. Ephesians 1.16 says, do not cease to give thanks yeah, Paul says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Sometimes God will put someone on your heart randomly. He did that with my son and his family the other day in Phoenix. So I woke up and I was about my day and the Lord stopped me and said, you need to pray for Philip, Justin, Rebecca, and Renee. And so I did. I just like, Lord, you know, sometimes I blow it. Sometimes it just goes over my head. But this time it didn't, praise God. He wanted me to pray, and lo and behold, they were on the highway. Their car just stopped on the highway. Phoenix is crazy. I mean, it's so is Chicago, but Phoenix is LA are like whew, crazy. And he was right near an exit. It literally plump, 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 plump. Like he, they could have really gotten hurt. It didn't surprise me when he called me that day. It didn't surprise me when he called me yesterday. So I know that. Um, when God makes, he'll, he'll want us sometimes to make mention. We don't have to be on the floor all the time, but making mention. Luke 18, 1 says that Jesus spoke a parable to them that men or women always ought to pray and not lose heart. Do not lose heart. Don't lose heart. Um, at First Thessalonians 5, 17 says pray without ceasing. And Philippians 4, 16 I think we all know that. Any of anyone who deals with anxiety knows this verse. <laughs> and I'm one. <laughs> Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And when you do the peace of God that surpasses all understanding is going to guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. So Colossians verse 4, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for the saints, isn't that precious? That's the report he heard about this church, well, that our church would have that report, right? That he heard of your faith in Christ and the love for all the saints because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. I love that the Colossians had faith in who? in Jesus. Love for who? One another. And it was no doubt because of what verse 5 says, their hope was eternal. Their hope was laid up in heaven. It was because of the hope of heaven. It was because of the glory of God that they had love for one another and faith in him. This quickens my heart, you know, to 1 Corinthians 13, 13, where it says, abide in faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. You know, in these last days, ladies, and we are living in them, I, I believe we are living in the last days, our faith is under attack, love is growing cold, hope is waning around us, and how we must abide in Jesus. We must simply abide in Jesus, because when we abide in Him, it solidifies our faith, it builds our hope, and it produces His heart of love in us. You know, my, my love's conditional, but oh, his love is unconditional. And that's the kind of love I want. I want his agape love. Verse 6, it's, he goes on to say, Which has come to you, as it has also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit, is it also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. You know, studying God's word, studying his truth, brings forth fruit in our lives. It just simply does. And it's the fruit of a changed life with new desires, new priorities, and ultimately the, ultimately the fruit of seeing people saved because of our lives. Verse 7, as you also learn from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, and I may not be saying his name right, I don't know, but that's how we're going to go with it tonight, <laughs> who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and also declared to us your love in the Spirit. You know, in these verses, in verse 7 and 8, we get a glimpse of Epaphras, the pastor, who started the church here in Colossus. You know, Paul had ministered at Ephesus and trained him up. And it says in Philemon, and Philemon is that little one-chapter book, 
that's just one chapter. <laughs> so it's Philemon verse 23. It says that um, a, a, a Paphos or a Pephas, whoever is, however I say that, he was a fellow prisoner with Paul. So he, you know, he, he was mentored by him. Epaphus' name means devoted, and I love that. And we see through scripture that he was not only devoted to God, but he was devoted to the people that God entrusted under his care. So he was a man of devotion. Devoted means very loving and loyal, faithful and true, steadfast, constant, committed, dedicated, and devout. We see in verse 7 that he was named a servant of God and a faithful minister of Christ, and that his good report concerning the believers there were sent to Paul. It was Ephesus' concerns that most likely moved Paul to address the church of Colossus because he reported back to him here. We see the character of this pastor of Colossus Class in chapter 4 of um, Colossians, it says that, it, this is what he's described of in that chapter, a bondservant, a slave of Christ. He labored fervently and passionately for the saints in prayer, and he had a great zeal for them. What an amazing pastor. What an amazing man of God. Oh, what an what, what a example of, of what a pastor should be. Colossians 1, 9, we're going to read 9 through 12 here because this, we're going to spend more time here, okay? And you all know why. <laughs> this is awesome. Okay, for this reason, Paul goes on to say, We also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, that you will be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Wow. After Paul's opening greeting and praise to God for the faith in Christ, their love for the saints, their hope of heaven, uh, the fruit that was coming forth from their fellowship, he now begins to offer up this prayer on their behalf. And I think this is one of the most powerful prayers in the New Testament for God's people. And it is a prayer that you and I ought to take on for ourselves, for our pastors, for our husbands, for our children, for our grandchildren, all those that you hold dear to your heart, you should begin to pray these, this prayer in these verses. We're going to look at this a little bit more deeply. Paul here requests, they, their requests fall under like four categories here. Um, he, the first one is that they would be filled with the knowledge of God's will. The second was that they would have a walk worthy of the Lord. The third, that they would be fruitful in every good work and that they would be thankful to the Father. You know, I think it interesting that Paul never met these people, but from the first time he heard about their faith in Jesus, he started praying for them and he didn't stop. He says, I pray without ceasing for you. I love that. I pray without ceasing for you. Oh, that we must pray without ceasing. Again, again, quickly we're reminded just within a few verses that we women of God must pray without ceasing and do not stop. Do not stop. We must pray and pray and keep on praying and never stop praying and wait until the answer is there. And I know I've shared this before, but start your journal. And that's what I've done, the prayers of, of the saints, of my family, I journal. And then when they're answered, I will date when I started praying for them. Some have been 20 years, some have been two months, some has only a week, you know. And I, then I date the answer. And oh, you know what it does for me? It just causes me to fall more in love with the Lord. That He would hear my prayers. I know He does, but that, that, that He would do that. 
because he's an awesome God. He starts with that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. You know, many Christians will ask, how can I know the will of God? That's such a you know deep question, isn't it? And there's so many false things going on and teachings about that. There are some teachings out there from churches in the area that are saying, well, whatever you feel is right, it's God's will. That is so wrong. That is so biblically wrong. Because first of all, we our feelings don't matter. It's what God's word says. And so, you know, I can only say I could break this up into two parts. There is God's general will for our lives and then his individual will for our lives. So how do we determine that? What do we do? Well, his general will is found in the pages of scripture, primarily in the New Testament. We know it's his will for us to be saved. We know it's God's will for us to be filled with the Spirit. We know it's God's will for us to be set apart and sanctified. We know it's God's will to be submissive. We know that it's God's will for us to be willing to even suffer and be persecuted for his name. His specific or individual will for each believer's life is a little more complicated. But can I just say this? This is what I truly believe and I, you know, Pastor Phil does too. If we seek to obey God in the general will of what the scripture is saying every day of our lives, there's not going to be a problem. If we walk in the spirit and have the mind of Christ and pray for his guidance, he will reveal to us the individual will in our life, what job we should take, should we move, should we purchase this home, should we talk to my to our, our prodigal, should we not talk to our prodigal and just pray, you know, those individual things as we are in the general will that we know we need to be in, he's going to lead us. It's going to be simple. It's not going to be complicated. It's not going to be hard. We're just going to know. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, I, so many people, I've gave this to my, I still give this to my kids. Like they, ever since they were little, I have Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, you know, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your understanding. Not what you think is right. That's not God's will, <laughs> what you think is right. It's what God thinks is right, you know. And lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. And you know what? He will direct your path just simple. Psalm 32, 8 and 9 says, I, God, will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. And I love what Pastor Phil has said before that, you know, you, you know, when you're looking in somebody's eyes and they want to get your attention somewhere and you're, they kind of go like this, you won't see that unless you're looking in their eyes. And, you know, I think about me looking in the eyes of my Savior through the scripture, through the pages of the word, through prayer. As I look into his eyes, I could see where his eye is leading me. I could see that. So he will guide us with his eye. Do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. Paul goes on to qualify his request by saying this, that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and then in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, before I go ahead to define those terms in the Greek, um, I want you to notice the words that Paul's using here. Wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. He uses these words quite a bit in this epistle. You could either underline them if you'd like, if you like to do that kind of thing. Um, and why does he use those words? Well, these were the same words the Gnostics of that day were using. They would use these words to draw people. So Paul's like redeeming these words from them and applying them to Christians in their life in Christ. And that's why he uses these words. Well, you see that the Gnostics considered themselves superior, like I said, in spiritual wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. That's what they thought. And so um, Paul's saying, you know what? They aren't, but you can be through your relationship with Jesus. For in him are all the treasures of wisdom and understanding. You know, I always share that when you're opening your word, before you even read it, pray. 
that God will open your eyes, that you might see wondrous things from His law, that you would see the things that you have never seen before, that the scriptures will be quickened and come alive to your very heart. You know, where they're leaping off the pages, and, and, and He does that. You could read a verse on and off for years, but when you pray a prayer, all of a sudden you'll read and it'll be quick into your heart. It looks like it lifts off the pages right into your heart. And, and He does that. He will give us all the fullness that of His wisdom and knowledge, not for our glory, but for His glory. Um, have you noticed how the devil, though, like the Gnostics in that time, you know, they, he, they, he will deceive people in false doctrine using our Christian terms. Have you noticed that? That's why, ladies, we have to be women of the word. We need to know it and we, so that we can, we can discern when something is being said to us that isn't accurate in truth. But in verse 9, the word knowledge, it's not, um, it's not just knowledge in the Greek, okay? Um, it's overflowing knowledge in the Greek. It's, it's more than just knowledge. It's an overflowing. So he want, he's praying for the saints to have an overflowing knowledge. And that's what we need to pray. Sometimes our prayers are small. We need to make them big. God's a big God. And um, he wants to give us more than what we even think we need. Um, filled in this verse means controlled by as in filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, having the Spirit, just the baptism of the Holy Spirit come upon you. There's three workings of the Spirit. Before you are saved, the Spirit comes alongside you, wooing you to get saved. When you have given your heart to Jesus, the Spirit comes in you. But there's a third working, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where the Spirit comes upon you with deutimous power, which we've seen in the book of Acts, which is, I believe, is for today, for you and I. And that's what he is praying here, for this type of filling uh, to be filled with. Um, the wisdom here is that proper application of knowledge. Godly wisdom comes from knowing God's Word and applying it properly in your life. Spiritual understanding here, the Holy Spirit leading you into God's truth and opening your understanding to what He has said. John 16, 13 says, However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you in all truth. When you have the Holy Spirit, He's going to, you don't have to doubt that He's not guiding. When you are a child of God and born again and the Spirit is in you, don't doubt when He is leading and guiding you because He is. You know, I don't know all of you in this room, but I know a lot of you, and I know that you are women that desire His will and the Spirit's leading and the Spirit's discernment in your life. And don't doubt it. You know, when He speaks to your heart, don't do that. Or why don't you say that? Or why don't you not say that? Listen, you're women of God. You're before Him. You're seeking Him. Know that. Don't doubt that he is his leading you. First John 2.20 says, But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things, those things that are mysteries. But the anointing in verse 27 of 1 John 2 says, Which you have received from him abides in you. And you don't need anyone to teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true and is not a lie. And just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. Oh, that we would abide in him. He goes on to say that they would have a walk worthy of the Lord. Jesus, when he taught this walk and worthy, he always taught things coupled with learning and living. You know, learning and living. We see that throughout his ministry. And in verse 9, we see the cause, but in verse 10, we see the effect. In verse 9, we see the cause, and in verse 10, we see the effect. So the more you grow in the knowledge of the Lord, the stronger you will get in your walk with the Lord. Walk here means that outward activity of your life that people can see. Wow. That outward activity of your life that people can see. I have seen Christians who have a lot of head knowledge, but their walk is shallow and often carnal. 
because they're not taking the knowledge and living it. Oh, how we must do that. We can't just know it, ladies. We need to live it every day and every moment. And of course, we're going to fall short. We're not going to be perfect, but our desire should be to take the knowledge that we know, take this knowledge that we are reading about and studying in Colossians and live it out, live it out. Worthy means having the weight of or weighing as much as another thing. In other words, may your walk weigh as much as your talk. You know, that's so important um, because so many times um, there are individuals that I know um, that they, 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 they claim they've been converted and I can't doubt that. That's what they're telling me and I can't say that they're not saying the truth, but their lives don't match up. There's vulgarities coming out of their mouth. They're swearing, their actions, the, the pattern of their life. I love when Pastor Phil brought that out yesterday. You know, it's a pattern of life. I mean, we all, we all fall short. We all fail sometimes, but it's that pattern of life. And it doesn't match with what they say. Oh, how our walk has to match our talk. Or we should just be silent and just work on the walk so that when we talk, <laughs> the walk will be there. <laughs> Enough said. <laughs> A walk worthy. <laughs> um, anyway, and then fully pleasing him. Um, I love Revelation 4.11. It says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they were created you know we were created for him not for ourselves not for our pleasure or our fame or our being gloried but we were created for him and i it humbles me to think that he created me for his pleasure that he would take delight in this me <laughs> that he would delight in me and and i think about how he delights in you he delights in you. He delights in you right where you're at, in your shortcomings, in your failings. He delights in you. He delights in you even when you miss your daily devotions. He delights in you. You are a delight to him. And, and that overwhelms me at times um, to think of that. Jesus wants to make you the object of his pleasure, not for his selfish reasons. He's not a selfish God. No but for your good, so that he can love you and cleanse you and bless you in, into eternal life. Therefore, to the extent you please him is the extent in which you will experience fulfillment in the deepest part of your soul. I don't know about you, but it's when I serve him through the ministry or through my <coughs> husband, um, you know, it just delights my soul. In the deepest parts, I do it unto the Lord. And it just, it just quickens my soul to Him. I, 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 I just, I'm fulfilled in Him. In Him. Not in what I did. My fulfillment doesn't come in the service I do. My fulfillment comes that I get to serve Him. That's where my fulfillment comes in. Then Paul prays that they would be fruitful in every good work. The purpose of our Christian lives is to serve the Lord, to do the good works that he has ordained for our lives. You know, often as evangelicals, we get very uncomfortable talking about works. And the reason is, is that because so many times religions make that as a basis of a way to get to heaven. So we tend to not talk about works, but works are very important as a Christian. The New Testament has much to say about good works and how God expects his people to walk in them. I, you know, I'm going to go through this really fast, so you don't have to feel like you have to make notes. If you want, I can provide you this, okay? But in Ephesians 2.10, it says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
Titus 3.8 says, This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. Titus 2.14 says, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed, and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. So works should identify a true believer in Christ. God wants us to bear fruit for his glory in everything we do for him. That's what fully pleases him. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine and you are the branches and he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Fruit is what he is calling us to. And we cannot bear fruit unless we are abiding. We are in his presence and we are seeking his heart and seeking his mind and, and, and loving him and passionately spending time in his word. And we, that's how we bear fruit, ladies. This fruit in the believer's life will take different forms. And I'm going to go through this fast. So just listen. And then, like I said, I'll give you notes if you need. In Galatians 5, we see the fruit of the Spirit. They're the inward attributes of God. In 2 Corinthians 9, the fruits of righteousness. They're the outward attributes or fruit in our life. We see the fruit of holiness in Romans 6. We see the fruit of souls one to Jesus in Philippians 1. The fruit of rewards in heaven for faithful service. Can you believe that? That overwhelms me. That in heaven, there for the faithful service that we do, it will be the fruit of our rewards. I, I, I'm overwhelmed by that. The fruit of good works done for the Lord here on earth in Colossians 1. And then the fruit of our lips singing praises, praises to God in Hebrews 13. Oh, that we may have a walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work. And then, he says, increasing in the knowledge of God. This isn't just head knowledge, again, but life knowledge, life experience. I love this progression that Paul prays here. Wisdom leads to a walk, which results in a work, but then he brings it full circle here, and the work that you may increase in the knowledge of God. It's like he just brings it full circle. I love it. We learn to grow and serve, which in turn teaches us more about God. A Christian who has only head knowledge will only grow so much in their relationship with God and therefore in their knowledge of God. And it's not until they begin to serve the Lord that their understanding of Him is deepened. Paul goes on to say in verse 11, Strengthen with all might according to His glorious power. This might here is dunamis power. We see that in Acts. And the power in the Greek here is the power or the goodness of God as manifested through us. So in other words, God doesn't just fill us with supernatural dynamic abilities so we can live in neutral. No, he doesn't do that. And so many times we do. We have the power of God and we live in neutral. <laughs> We're just stuck here. He doesn't want that. He wants to engage that power through, through our good works, through the fruit of our works, so that others can benefit from the power of the Holy Spirit that he may be glorified and you are, have joy. Colossians, well, let me just say that Dr. Ray Edmond, he's the late president of Wheaton College here in Illinois, he used to remind his students, it's always too soon to quit. And I want, I'm talking about patience. It's the next thing that Paul talks about, for all patience and long suffering with joy. The word patience is endurance when circumstances are difficult. Oh, how we need to endure in the cir circumstances that are difficult. We can endure through Jesus. That's the only way we can endure. That's the only way we can endure. Too many of us have a tendency to quit or to stop when the circumstances get difficult, but we need to move on. Now, patience here is different from long-suffering. The word uh, long-suffering means self-restraint, and it's the opposite of revenge. Patience has to do primarily with the circumstances, while long-suffering has to do with people. 
Um, and God is long-suffering toward people, and only he can give us that. He mentions joy, and this, this joy is not happiness. Happiness comes from the word, the word happen tense, happen tense, happenstance, happenstance, okay, I said it right, which means chance or luck. That's what the word happiness comes from. Happiness is a feeling that comes upon us when our outward you know, circumstances are positive, then we're happy. But joy, oh no, joy is an inward quality of the heart, and it doesn't depend on our outward circumstances. It is born when you are born again. Joy is a characteristic of God and his nature, and it's only available to those who are in Christ, this inner joy. Let's go to verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to, the par to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. The word qualified here means make fit or worthy. The word deliver here means rescued from danger. The word conveyed here is a word used to describe the deportation of a population from one country into another. It's kind of interesting. So Jesus, through his blood, rescued you and me from the kingdom of Satan and this kingdom of darkness, and he relocated us into God's kingdom, a kingdom of light, a kingdom of love, and a kingdom of peace. Verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Redeem means to purchase and set free by paying a price. And he did that for you and for me. Verse 15, he is the, we're going to read 15 through 18. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things created that are in heaven and are earth, visible and visible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things we he may have the preeminence. God the Father stamped his image on human flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. Wow. Wow. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. In other words, he is the perfect manifestation of the Father in human form. <clears throat> you know, we know this, but sometimes it just stop and think about this. It's quite amazing. Image here is used to describe as exact replica, an exact replica. Replica. Jesus Christ has manifested to us the invisible God. The firstborn of every creature does not mean that Jesus is a created being. Can you note that? Because it seems like that's what it might be saying. It is not saying that. It means creation originated from Jesus and that he is preeminent and above, superior to creation. He is the source as well as the head. 15, these verses 15 through 17, they substantiate the deity of God. I love Hebrews 1, 3. It says, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the power of his word, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Wow. You know, preeminence means the fact of surpassing all others, superiority, supremacy, greatness, excellence, distinction, importance, prestige, stature, fame, renown. If you are at a loss in your worship time at home, proclaiming the name of God, take this definition out again or look it up and begin to tell him you are superior you are preeminent you are renowned you are fame you are glory you are majesty on high 
oh, how we are, I, I, th I can't believe that God would give us this, that he loves you and I so much, this amazing, superior, supreme God who created all things. Oh, his glorious power. Verses 19 through 23. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him whether things on earth, things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you, who once was alienated, and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, this, I have to tell you, when I, when I read this at home, I had to stop and, and get on my knees. This is what he did for you and I. He reconciled us from, you know, we were alienated from him. We gave our hearts to Jesus Christ, and he reconciled us. And this is what he's going to do. He is going to present you and I holy, blameless, and above reproach. Wow. Wow. Now, you know, it, I believe that the Word of God is truth. And if I didn't, it would be hard to believe this because of how I know I am, do you know? Mm -hmm. But yet in this weak body, in this frail mind, in this life of shortcomings that needs work, He is going to present me holy and blameless and above reproach in His sight. And it goes on in verse 23, If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded, steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister, it pleased the Father that in Jesus all the fullness would dwell. All the fullness of the deity of God abides in him. I say we should all memorize Colossians 1.22 these next couple weeks. Journal it, memorize it, keep it in your hearts because when you meditate on this, you will be able to think on it in those times when you mess up, when you feel maybe really terrible about past sins or the enemy's right there to cause you to feel insecure or unsure or doubtful. He is going to present you holy, blameless and above reproach in his sight. Verse 23, the word if carries with it the idea of assuming that you continue in the faith. That is to say that continuing in the faith is not a condition. It's, that's what it appears to be. That's not what it's saying. It's a characteristic of those who are in Christ that they continue in their fate, no matter how many times they fall, I mean, how many times they fail, that we continue, that we get back up in the power of God and continue in our faith. Again, that pattern that Pastor Phil is talking about versus falling sometimes. Well, let's finish the chapter, and I'm going to close, um, but we'll finish with these last few verses verse 24 through 29 I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body which is the church of which I become a minister according to the stewardship from God which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations but now has been revealed to his saints to them God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among Gentiles. And may I pause here for a minute? The Gnostics also use the word mystery over and over and over again in their talk, in their lingo. And Paul is saying, you know what this mystery is? Here it is. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you and Christ in me, that is the mystery. That is the hope that we have. He's in us, that hope of glory. And then he goes on, In him, him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. 
Let me just comment very briefly here. We could paraphrase and say, when Christ is in you, when you're born again, that is the assurance of glory or heaven. That is our assurance. Jesus in us, our assurance of heaven. You know, when Paul preached the gospel to the lost, he included a warning for them to flee the wrath that was to come. Unlike many today that they don't preach that, but he was a preacher of warning and teaching. And I praise God that our pastor, Pastor Phil, is a teacher of warning and teaching. And let me tell you, sometimes he gets called out by his um, uh, peers because of his warning. But his, his heart, his verse for this, his ministry is, I will not shun, you know, to speak out the whole counsel of God. And when warning needs to be warned, it needs to be warned. When the people need to be warned, they need to be warned of certain things. And so, and that's what the Apostle Paul did. He, and he warned and he preached. And I love that. We see that here. And when he taught the saints, his goal was to give them the whole counsel of God so that he could solemnly present them to the Lord perfect. Now that Greek word there doesn't mean perfect. It means mature. And I think about that and how, what liberating grace is that on us that we, we are going to fail, you know, in our walk at times and we are not going to be the perfect Christian woman all the time, but we are maturing in him. And that's something that Pastor Phil and I both want in our lives and in the lives of everyone we love here is to keep walking and going forward, not to stay in neutral, not to stand still, but to move forward, mature in your walk, even if it's baby steps. You mature in little ways and you continue to mature in Him. That's what we need to do. The goal of Christianity really isn't salvation. We have that. We're saved. The goal is sanctification. It's sanctification. That's our goal. The Christ-likeness. Not so much that we are perfect, but oh, how, I don't know about you, but I desire to be more like him. So this little four chapter <laughs> book of Colossians, well, its truths are eternal and its application is timeless. It is timeless. We are applying this written epistle. How many years from when it was written to our lives? Oh, how we need, and Kay brought this out in her study, how we need a greater revelation of who Jesus is. And we can't get that unless we are women of the word and we are on our knees before him constantly. Oh, how we need to meditate on the truths of this four-chapter book. Um, Kay, I'm going to close with this quote from Kay. Um, so I don't know if those of you know that Kay Smith, you know, she um, has a dementia. So she is unable to teach and do ministry. And so she's at home and she's being cared for by her children. But um, I, being brought up under her as her being a mentor to me from afar, but then when I would go see her teach, she was just so with it, a woman of the word, you know. And so um, you will find me quoting her a lot because I respect her deeply. Um, but anyway, I'm going to close with this quote. The blessed and glorious theme of Christian ministry, and she closed chapter 4, the very bottom, with this. So it's in your book, you know, so you have the quote in your book. Um, and the other quote is in the book, too. Um, she said, the blessed and glorious theme of Christian ministry is this. Christ, the divine person, the anointed Savior, the revealer of God, the atonement for sin, the guide, the satisfaction and completion of life, the refuge of the past, the stay of the present. He is the hope of the future. Amen. 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 Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that we have the privilege of opening your word and just getting a glimpse of your glory through these these words these this one chapter this just one chapter that we hardly touched father may you give each of us a deeper understanding of the truths in this book that lord we would 
fall deeper in love with you, fall passionately in love with your word, that, Lord, we will be women who reflect you to a lost and dying world for your glory. Father, I thank you for every woman here. Lord, you know them by name. You know the hurts that they have brought in this room. You know their deepest desires. You know the prayers that they pray. Father, would you answer their prayers? Will you meet those desires in the depths of their heart, Lord, and that you would heal their hurts and that you will use those complicated hurts in their lives to bring you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.